Hi everyone, and welcome to this session about microfrontends and the patterns. My name is Luca Mezzadira. I'm a principal solution architect at AWS. I'm an international speaker and a Riley author. You know, I would like to start with a bit of history just to recap where we are uh, nowadays with microfrontends. So the first uh, appearance of microfrontends or microapps as they were called was in, in 2015. 2015, we have seen um, Taylor.js that was um, part of, the, of a larger framework called Mosaic 9 that was released open source uh, by Zalando, the fashion e-commerce. Taylor.js was a AUI composer where it was retrieving multiple uh, fragment, HTML fragments, composing them and serving to, uh, to a, a user. That was the first implementation of Microphone Tens, despite the name wasn't uh, yet there. In 2016, Microphone Tens uh, shows for the first time inside the um, technology radar uh, or made by uh, ThoughtWorks. The interesting part here that they are trying, they are suggesting to assess this specific architecture in order to understand uh, and see if the benefits of microservices were applicable also on the front end. After a few years in 2019, we started to see a raise of microphone tents. Probably 2019 was the first year where finally we can start to see uh, um, a lot of companies em embracing microphone tents. As you can see from these slides, we have quite a few of them that uh, are uh, that were using microphone tents uh, in production. And in 2020, microphone tents were inside the architecture and design repo from InfoQ, uh, where um, they, they describe microphone tents as um, embraced by innovators uh, alongside many other technologies. It's very interesting that at this time, microphone tents as a modular uh, architecture uh, was at the same category of data mesh. That is another way to uh, modularize your um, uh, data um, when we are talking about um, managing uh, data from multiple teams and in multiple domains. In 2021, I would call that was the year of discovery. In fact, uh, uh, more companies are embracing microphone dance and um, there are new learnings and uh, new trials, uh, and new discovery in general of best practices on how to embrace microphone dance. So far, what we have learned on microphone tents is that they uh, are great for incremental upgrades. We can take a slice of our uh, domain or application and iterate on that and slowly but steadily um, implement new functionalities without impacting the rest of uh, the application. Uh, we have a decentralization concept where we start to have uh, teams that are responsible to take decisions and uh, they are responsible also about their own future. Uh, that is a very interesting concept because if before um, with uh, monolithic architecture, uh, we had architects and tech leaders that they were, talking, uh, were taking their uh, own decision for the entire platform, here every team is responsible to follow some guardrails provided by uh, the tech leadership and uh, but they have also in, in power to take certain decisions inside those guardrails. Uh, there are also a reduction of cognitive load for the team where instead of being aware of the entire application they became the main expert inside uh, their area. And finally um, they um, it's, it's a good way to scale uh, the technology as well as the, the organization like microservices for instance uh, we are uh, creating a distributed system that is not only solving a technology problem but also an organization one because we create independent teams that they can uh, take their own decisions inside certain bundles one thing that uh, uh, we learn uh, in, in Amazon is uh, that it, there is no compression argument for experience. That is what our CEO often uh, are telling us uh, in many of the all ends sessions. And I fully agree with this, uh, with this approach because uh, what I have learned is uh, when you are experiencing this uh, implementation and you see how implementing in this case microphone tests, you discover a lot of things. What you're going to see uh, in the next few slides are example of experience that I um, was involved to. And um, I, it's not only say, potential things that happen, 
are situations that really happen, a use case that really happened to me, and we found a way to overcome them. So uh, let's start with the first anti-pattern, uh, the yin and the yang, or the difference between microphone tens and components. So the first one, let's talk about component. A component is uh, potentially this button. And in this button, what we can do is defining a label. And that is very normal for, for a component. But then, moreover, um, the product evolves, and this, but this button starts to have also the possibility to set up um, an icon. So now we can set up the icon and the label. Moreover, there is a new requirement where, uh, on a specific area of our application, we want to have a different border color of this button. And then we want to set up a different rollover animation. Therefore, the button incorporate the, both of those changes and um, we can orchestrate them uh, from, from the container. Then uh, we decide that because of interna internationalizations, we can uh, have an auto size dimension because we know by um, upfront that certain languages require more space than, than others. And therefore, we need to figure, uh, figure out the logic that allows us to do so. And finally, uh, there are some um, area of the application where we want this button that is disabled by default till the user is interacting with a specific form. So as you can see, there are different state uh, and different properties of this button. And uh, this button is encapsulating all of these things. But uh, the reality is that the, the button uh, is fully managed by the, this container. And that is what a component is. There is an extensibility characteristic that is intrinsic about this component. Let's see how um, a microphone 10 would, would work. So first of all, let's define what a microphone 10 is. Microphone 10 are a technical representation of a piece of subdomain, allow independent implementation with same or different technology. They are, uh, they, we minimize the code share with other subdomains and finally are owned by a single team. So on this definition, I think there are two things that are quite key to understand the difference between a microphone tent and component. The first of all, microphone tents uh, are a technical representation of a piece of subdomain. So if we're familiar with domain driven design, this is just a portion of uh, an entire system. And that's very important because they are not solving a technical problem, but they are uh, instead um, a, a sh showing how a business domain should be rendered. And more importantly, they are independent implementations. So the recent end container that should orchestrate or even um, provide too many properties that are uh, changing the way how the microphone tent works, that the logic on how the microphone tent should work is based on the domain and therefore they are fully encapsulated. So a microphone 10 in this case uh, is independent. So we can independently deploy a microphone 10 uh, and we don't need to coordinate with uh, other uh, parts of the system. They are domain aware. So we don't have to inject certain uh, information in order to make the microphone 10 behave in a different way. That is something that if has to be, uh, if the microphone then should behave in different ways, it should be the microphone then itself to retrieve the information related uh, to its context in order to um, uh, behave. And therefore, the container itself became a, a, a laying container, a dump container, where uh, we have a container with uh, um, that is just loading multiple microphone tabs, and that's it. It shouldn't be uh, aware of uh, the different domain that are loaded inside itself. For communicating, a microphone 10 uh, is usually um, defining the input and output. But majority of the time, the communication between microphone tens is happening uh, following the pop sub pattern. Therefore, an event emitter or custom events uh, or even a reactive stream are all good ways to communicate between uh, microphone tens. And finally, microphone tens are not extensible. As, as we said, they are domain aware. And therefore, the only thing that usually we can inject is in the microphone 10 is in the case of the event emitter, the instance of the event emitter, but we are not going to, to provide properties and other information that will um, uh, make the microphone dance reactive. All the logic of that uh, will be, um, will be uh, encapsulated inside the microphone dance. So usually when, when uh, you 
understand uh, deeply the, the difference, you don't end up with a situation like this, where you are, you go very, very granular and you say, oh yeah, I have tens of microphone tens in my same view. There is uh, uh, more often than not the possibility that when you end up in a situation like this, you are dealing with components. Therefore, the granularity that you have uh, is not the right one. You should go back to the whiteboard and make sure that you are um, dividing your application with multiple microphone tens and not components. Second anti pattern is the Hydra of Lerner uh, or the multi framework approach. More often than not, I have seen uh, many people thinking that microphone tents are uh, a way to uh, deal with multiple UI frameworks. And despite that you, you can, it doesn't mean that you have to use. For instance, how many of you uh, would use uh, in a single page application multiple UI libraries, maybe Angular with uh, React or Angular with uh, Vue.js? Probably the answer would be none of you or not many, uh, because definitely there are a performance implication on, on, a, um, on introducing multiple UI libraries, but moreover, it wouldn't make any sense because uh, you risk to have um, not only the UI uh, library, but also other libraries related to a specific framework or the UI library, like the state uh, manager, for instance, uh, just to name one, that are dedicated to a specific thing. So your bundle size starts to grow, grow, and grow, and it's possible also that the could be some runtime clashes. So uh, in a multi-framework approach with microphone dance is true, it's possible. And there are situations where it's very, very uh, important using it. So for instance, uh, when we are dealing with a legacy system and uh, we want to migrate from um, an existing system uh, to uh, a, a new system, using uh, this approach is definitely uh, a, a, good, uh, a good way. And also when we are migrating from the same framework uh, or we want to migrate to a new framework um, uh, and we want to, to migrate to microphone dance using, uh, using for a certain period of time multiple UI frameworks is something that is acceptable because you know that is a temporary change and despite you are creating uh, and causing um, potential uh, issues on uh, downloading more code uh, at the beginning for your customer, uh, you know that at the end this will uh, pan out well because you know uh, that it, uh, you are migrating for a small amount of time. And finally, when you are acquiring new companies, if you want to integrate the um, software from the acquire company inside your application, using microphone tents with um, a different stack is definitely something that is doable. I think there are these three scenarios that I have seen useful, uh, the console multi-framework, but more in general, if you're starting a Greenfield project, don't start with the idea of, I want to integrate multiple frameworks because you will have some performance penalties. Another anti-pattern is that Swiss army knife or right uh, programs that, that do one thing and do it well, like uh, Unix uh, in, um, taught us in, in the past. So imagine that you have a Greenfield project and you have your application shell that is the dotted line and uh, the application shell is loading one microphone tab. Then you, uh, after a while, you, you think, okay, but I cannot load just one microphone tent per time. On top of that, where it's covering vast majority of the uh, scenarios, I also need to have multiple microphone tents in the same view. Not many, because we organize that are microphone tents, but the application shell should be aware that uh, should load not just one sometimes, but also multiple microphone tents. So in that case, then you define the communication between microphone tents when they are in the same view, and also how to communicate uh, between microphone tents in um, uh, multiple views using local storage, for instance. And uh, the application shell is also responsible uh, to load uh, microphone tents via system.js. Therefore, every microphone tents entry point corresponds to a JavaScript file. This is the decision that you have made in your Greenfield project. But suddenly, what happened is that you are um, a, a new request is to embed the legacy editor uh, or the legacy application that is um, uh, available, and you want to create a compelling and cohesive experience for your user. Therefore, you want to integrate this uh, editor inside um, your microphone dance implementation. Now, the problem is your teams have no clue on how the uh, editor works, and they don't want to risk to uh, manage that in, inside the 
in the same way how they handle the microphone dance. There is no way that they're going to rewrite from scratch because it would take too long. And therefore, the idea is creating, uh, what, uh, let's say, an, uh, um, a microphone ten that has a container that act as an anti-corruption layer. So that means basically that the legacy editor, in order to avoid the crash with the rest of the application, could be loaded inside an iframe. But because your um, application shell communicates using, for instance, even the meter and the, um, uh, local storage, we can sanitize, if you want, uh, the uh, iframe implementation of the legacy editor, uh, wrapping it inside a container that is uh, basically acting as a translator from uh, the communication between um, the iframe to the rest of the world. That provides uh, a, a nice way to decouple uh, the legacy application with uh, the new Greenfield. It's also providing um, uh, an alignment on the architectural decision because you don't have to use post message like you would use for, for an iframe, but you will use uh, the way how you, you use to communicate with the rest of the application. And finally, uh, if in the future you will have time to uh, rewrite from scratch that specific um, editor, uh, you don't have to um, rewrite the application shell that should be able to communicate with iframe and load an iframe um, and the rest of the application that is Greenfield, but you have an application that can be, uh, can be removed and replaced very quickly with a new brand new microphone time that iteratively can, can be deployed and replaced, slowly but steady the entire uh, legacy application. This is a, a great approach for handling uh, uh, this, uh, this scenario without um, compromising in a, a, a cohesive uh, API specification. Another one is the return ticket uh, or uh, the unidirectional data flow. Uh, the, um, uh, I think uh, you are familiar with module federation. And one thing uh, that, uh, that is a Webpack uh, plugin that was released with the Webpack 5 and is available also with, uh, with Angular. Uh, and one of the uh, beauty of, of these uh, or the capabilities of this uh, fantastic um, uh, plugin is that you can uh, lazy load specific uh, uh, application or remote bundles uh, inside a, a host or a container. And that is nothing wrong with that. I think is, is, is a great implementation is uh, taking care about the undifferentiating heavy lifting, lifting for you, so you don't have to, um, let's say, take care about clashing with dependencies or how to load specific uh, microphone tests. The only thing that uh, is not always working as, as expected is that you can have a bi-directional sharing between um, uh, microphone tests. In this case, the host can share something with the remote and vice versa. In the past, we have learned that this bi-directional communication is not um, a, a great ally, ally for uh, developing application, especially when you work in multiple teams. Uh, unidirectional data flow is a concept that is uh, very well known in the industry. Uh, I remember when, for instance, for the first time, um, I have seen Flux, uh, that was a framework um, that was leveraging the concept of unidirectional data flow. And the idea is that basically you have only one flow uh, and um, a, a way to, the, a, a way to uh, understand how the data are moving from one step to another one. Uh, after Flux, there are other architectures that started to use uh, the same concept. For instance, uh, the model view intent that, that, um, uh, will, that let's say, was um, created a few years ago, uh, and it, it was present in JavaScript with um, Cycle.js, but also now is embraced uh, on a native Android application, uh, leverage the same concept where you have a user interaction that is uh, communicating with uh, your they, their intent. For instance, they click a button for submitting a form, for instance, that will update the model, the model will uh, load a new state, and then the state will be rendered in front of the user. This unidirection flow uh, is uh, another way for, for handling that. And those are just some examples on how unidirectional flow started to raise inside the front-end community. Uh, the important thing of, of uh, unidirectional data flow are the first are easy to debug. It's predictable. I know exactly what to expect the next time when uh, if something's not working, if uh, I, I know exactly uh, how to debug my application, because uh, for instance, if I know that um, uh, in, in the previous step, I had the right data and the next step, I don't have the right data. So probably something is happening uh, in, in, in between or in the second step. 
and also is less prone to errors because once again, uh, it's very predictable. And therefore, I, I can understand that very quickly. This is uh, very important. So when you're using module federation, but not only with module federation, uh, also when you are creating your custom implementation, bidirectional communication uh, between the container and the and microphone 10 uh, is, uh, can cause more problems than not, especially when you work with multiple teams. Remember that what we are doing here is um, creating a distributed system uh, on, on the client side. And therefore, it's very, very important that we try to minimize um, the um, coupling between, between uh, systems, because otherwise we risk uh, that we always deploy together and we end up having a distributed monolith that is the worst of the both, both worlds. Uh, another anti-pattern relax, just code, and uh, or, or how to avoid organizational coupling. Um, one thing that they have seen more uh, quite often, uh, especially for teams that are emb embracing microphone dance for the first time, they, they have a situation like that. They have multiple microphone dance with multiple teams that are taking care of, and then they start to create a global state where everyone is right in there. The problem with this approach is that now we are coupling the teams because if microphone 10 A that is, uh, that is creating a new variable that is used by also other microphone tents inside the global state, uh, that means uh, every time they change something, maybe they move from an object to an array or whatever it is, they need to coordinate the change across multiple teams. And basically we are breaking the uh, independence of microphone tents because we are coupling them, not only at the technical level, but also and more importantly, if you want, at the organization level, because every team has to be responsible for that. This is quite common and uh, trust me, there are easy way to fix that. That for instance is introducing the concept of the event meter, a pub sub pattern uh, that basically allows you uh, to decouple uh, the communication between microphone tents is the way to go. So in this case, if you have multiple teams working with, um, uh, let's say uh, together in the same view, and we want that microphone tent A uh, notify the others when a specific uh, state change inside this own microphone tent, they just need to use an event emitter, dispatch the event. And in that case, uh, who is interested to that specific event will react uh, to it. And that is great because it means that if tomorrow we have other two microphone tents that has to behave uh, or react uh, to a specific event, they just need to implement inside their own domain, so encapsulated basically inside their logic, uh, the behavior of that specific event when it's triggered. And, and also in the future, we can evolve these very quickly. The only thing that we need to do is uh, creating a good documentation and notifying uh, that there are uh, all the uh, notifying that there are in the wiki all the input and uh, the output of a specific microphone tent so every team can be aware on how to interact with your microphone tent finally uh, the last microphone, the last antipatter is let's armor the APIs. And um, one thing that they have seen is uh, sometimes uh, the granularity is very deep uh, and, and the nesting also can be very deep of microphone tents in the same view. And therefore we end up to have multiple microphone tents calling the same API. So uh, imagine, for instance, the scenario that we have this uh, very simple grid with multiple microphone tents and the two microphone tents at the bottom are calling the same API. Now, um, what does it mean for the backend? So let's imagine that those two microphone tents are calling an API. The first thing that uh, in a distributed uh, systems of microservices, uh, we will have is an API gateway that is uh, a, a central point to that expose all the APIs. Your API are uh, also under authentication, therefore the microphone tents are passing the JWT token. We are, there is the API gateway is triggering a central authorization service. And then after they, uh, they are authorized, they call the API one. But it's a microservices implementation. You don't have you don't have the guarantee that this API one will uh, be sufficient to reply to all the microphone tests. So in that case, you have API one that is calling other APIs, and therefore if before we have, uh, we plan to have uh, uh, just, uh, I don't know, one API call. In reality here, we have multiple API calls because uh, the nature of the distributed system. 
Now, it's okay if you have uh, 10 requests uh, per second, maybe, and in this case, uh, you're going to have 20. But the problem comes when you start to have uh, a million of requests per second, or uh, I don't know, a million requests per minute. And if you have two or multiple microphone tents in the same view that are calling uh, uh, this API, you can create a cascade effect and de facto potentially create um, a DDoS attack to your uh, same system. And, and, and that's not great only for the risk of, of doing so, but also for the cost of the infrastructure that is going to rise inevitably, because now the API one, the authorization service, and all the other APIs that are in, uh, um, uh, uh, bundled together for replying to all the microphone dance has to scale for that, uh, that level of, of uh, throughput. Um, this is definitely a, a big deal, because you are basically uh, risking to over complicate your, your infrastructure just for the sake of too much granularity because maybe you didn't spend enough time uh, defining your, your boundaries. So there are a couple of solutions for that. The first one is maybe go back to the whiteboard and start to see if those two domains are really two separate domains. If they are consuming the same APIs, there are, it's very likely, in my experience, that you have um, potentially the same domain. You just go to granular and maybe you confuse um, uh, components with microphone tents. The other approach is uh, if you really, really, really need to have uh, separated teams taking care about that, using components inside uh, a microphone tent. So you have a container of microphone tents that is really making the, the call. One team is responsible for that container and maybe one component, uh, and potentially both components, but no, it's not always possible. So maybe as, let's assume that um, the one team is responsible for component A and the container and another team is responsible for component B. So in that case, it became easier because as we have said before, you have you create an extensible, um, uh, let's say, element or uh, entity that will uh, allow the microphone ten to inject information in, and therefore the domain is not leaked uh, uh, in uh, the rest of the application, uh, and uh, is, uh, we will load just one microphone ten per time. <laughs> Uh, are some of the antipathies that I have seen so far. Bear in mind, the architecture is always a trade-off. There isn't right or wrong. As you have seen, we are suggesting certain uh, uh, solution based on specific context. But remember that you need to really understand the context before you can take a direction um, that feel, uh, fulfill your, your needs and your architecture characteristics. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I hope that you enjoy the talk. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach me out at that email that you can find at the bottom of this slide. Enjoy the rest of the conference.